Welcome to World Med School. My name is Monica Gandhi, and I'm a professor of medicine and the education director in the HIV division at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF. My lecture today is going to be about HIV, both how it entered human populations and the epidemiology of the infection. So the first clinical descriptions of HIV were released in June and July of 19, uh, 1981. And this was this huge surprise that these outbreaks of very unusual infections were started to be seen in men who have sex with men in major urban centers in the United States. These were infections like pneumocystis, Kaposi sarcoma, cytomegalovirus that had previously only been seen in transplant populations. But we knew about AIDS in 1981, but the question became, how did HIV enter human populations? Where did this come from? So that makes us take a step back and ask how any new pathogen enters human populations. So there are a variety of mechanisms as humans have increasingly encroached on the natural wor world, how um, new pathogens enter human populations. Um, one thing that's happening right now is global warming, where pathogens now, because it's warmer in their current niches, go to new niches, and then they have access to new hosts, which are not used to them. Zoonoses is a major um, way in which um, pathogens from animals enter human populations. We're having increasing interaction with animals through hunting, through eating, through keeping animals as pets. And zoonoses is one of the most common ways that a new microbe jumps from non-human to human hosts. And we'll talk about that more specifically because that is the mechanism by which HIV entered human populations. To just proceed, though, in our topic of how new pathogens enter human populations, um, changes in agricultural practices can bring um, new crops into new areas that attract new pests that then have access to human populations that are new to them. Um, as we get more crowded, we encroach more on animal habitats, and that crowds other animals together that usually shouldn't have been in contact. Um, and that crowding then can bring one microbe into contact with another animal that shouldn't have been in contact with that microbe, and then that can mutate to enter human populations. Certainly, um, as we become uh, more crowded, there's greater urbanization that leads to people crowding more together and spread of um, infectious diseases. And certainly what's played a major role in the spread of HIV and other modern pathogens is the extent of modern transport. Jet travel spreads diseases even when patients are asymptomatic, um, ships can certainly carry unintended passengers, and so that's been a major mechanism um, in the 20th and 21st century of spread of disease. And then finally, there's of course catastrophic events like breakdown of public health measures, poverty, war, famine, um, that have all led to pathogens coming into human populations. So to talk more specifically about HIV then, we have to first describe what HIV is. So HIV is a lentivirus, which is a subgroup of retroviruses. Retroviruses uh, specifically means that RNA is the genetic material of those viruses. And lentivirus, that clause means that it's a very slow virus where there's a long period of asymptomatic infection from the initial point of infection and the time when the patient manifests symptoms. HIV most resembles a group of lentiviruses that are present in all sorts of different primates. And those group of lentiviruses are called the simian immunodeficiency viruses. And um, specifically, if we look at the strains of HIV that are most prevalent in human societies, we can see that they are most likely to come from this, these specific primates. The most prevalent strain of HIV in the world is HIV-1 and specifically Group M. Group M of HIV-1 causes 90% of the world infections. And that strain is most closely related to the simian immunodeficiency virus from the chimpanzee called pan triglottides triglottides. There's also a couple of other HIV groups, Group N, O, and P, that come from different primates. Uh, HIV-2 is an infection that's most um, constricted to West and Central Africa and also regions of the world that had colonized or had interaction with those areas. And that specific strain 
is most closely related to the SIV strain from the Sudi Mangavi. Then you can see in the lower left-hand corner of this slide that group M strain has a number of different clades of infection, A, B, C, D, F, G, and so on, and those different clades are most prevalent in different areas of the world, with the group C clade being more, most prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. So then the question is, we know now that HIV, group M, looks most like the same immunodeficiency virus from a specific chimpanzee, but just because we know that it resembles it very closely, how did the pathogen get from the primate to the human host? The first theory that was propounded for how HIV entered human populations was um, written about in a book called The River, A Journey to the Source of HIV and AIDS by Edward Hooper in 1999. And what um, this author talked about was the idea that it was the oral polio vaccine that actually spread HIV into human populations. Um, at the time, uh, there were two groups that were competing for the first oral polio vaccine um, to be spread worldwide. Um, that was between um, Sabin, who actually won in a um, sort of um, contest by the NIH at the time, and another scientist named Hilary Kaprowski, who had come up with his own oral polio vaccine. Even though um, Dr. Kaprowski's uh, vaccine was not deemed to be most effective by the NIH committee, he did continue to administer his vaccine to about a million people in the Belgium-controlled Congo at the time, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, so he did um, have a mass vaccination campaign at the time. And what he had done was grown the, the vaccine in cells from African green um, monkeys, um, specifically kidney cells from African green monkeys. And the idea it was, was that it, the spread of HIV into human populations um, came about because of that vaccination campaign in West Africa um, because these were Belgium-controlled areas and he um, did use his vaccine in those areas. The problem was the timing didn't quite fit. We're going to talk about that in future slides. And um, beyond that, these weren't actually the right cells. These, uh, the HIV group M strain is not related to the African green monkey SIV strain. So for several reasons, this theory was debunked. So what was the crossover event? Well, at this moment, it seems like the most common prevailing theory that's propounded by scientists is that the way that HIV entered human populations is through close interactions with primates through the bushmeat trade. This practice, which has been increasing in the 20th century, is really the practice of hunting primates for food. And if you look at hunters in regions where HIV is thought to have entered human populations, specifically in West and Central Africa, hunters... Um, in the bushmeat trade have ve a lots and, and lots of SIV strains incorporated into their chromosomes. So it is thought that these hunters have um, an extreme amount of um, exposure to SIV strains through hunting practices, and then it's um, spread out from these hunters from the bushmeat trade that led to spread in human populations. And then it's really history, which I'll talk about in the next strain, that led to the massive spread of HIV infection in the late 20th century. This is a uh, particularly gruesome picture um, uh, from the article that I refer you to at the bottom of the slide um, that talks about why we think the bushmeat trade is the most um, um, reasonable theory for how HIV entered human populations. So then that leads to the question, when was the crossover event? So the oldest, the, the way to figure out when HIV entered human populations is to actually have blood samples from humans that were stored from a long time ago and figure out if HIV was present in them. And we actually don't have a lot of blood specimens or other specimens stored from humans um, from many years ago. The oldest known stored specimens from Africa um, that we could find were stored at the University of Washington, and these were specimens that were collected from the what was known as the Belgian Congo at the time, and there were about 1,200 plasma specimens um, that were collected in 1959. So they went back, sequenced all those plasma specimens, and found HIV in one strain. And that was called the ZR, Zyre 59 strain. And then what they did is looked at that particular strain that was found in a human population in 1959 and looked at it and saw how different it was from both the modern HIV strains at the time, 
in uh, the early 2000s, and also how different it was from the SIV um, strain in the chimpanzee. And by performing that phylogenetic analysis, they estimated that HIV entered human populations in 1930. And that's what we thought in the year 2000. Then luckily what happened um, in this uh, next paper that was published in 2008 is that another human sample was found. And this was a lymph node sample that was found in a paraffin embedded node from an adult female in Kinshasa in the Belgian Congo at the time. And that particular lymph node uh, was found in 1960, was um, collected in 1960, and that person had HIV. So they looked at that HIV strain, the DRC60, they call it, and they thought, well, it probably would look very similar to the ZR59 strain, but actually the strains were quite different, which meant that HIV was probably evolving in human populations for longer than since 1930. And by constructing a family tree and, and calculating a rate of mutation, at this point we think that the ancestor of HIV group M probably entered human populations much earlier, probably from between 1884 and 1924. Why we didn't see clinical manifestations of HIV disease prior to 1981 is likely because of history and politics and what was happening at the time in West Africa. So I refer you to this paper again, but in um, published in 2008, but this paper had a very nice slide on what was happening politically in the region and what was happening with population growth in the region that probably led to the eventual manifestation of disease of HIV. So in 1910, no city in the region of West Africa um, had a population that was greater than 10,000. Then what happened is colonialism happened. And with um, colonization, Kinshasa and other cities in West Africa grew in population size in the second half of the 20th century. And what probably happened is that HIV group M was brought from an individual from Cameroon, brought down to Kinshasa. The city population was growing as shown in the graph on the left. Sexual trades had been established in the setting of uh, colonialism. And by the 1960s, there were larger cities, there was a sex trade, and HIV was spreading more rapidly in West Africa. And by the 1970s, probably in retrospect, there was the first probable outbreak in Kinshasa of opportunistic infections. Then what happened from there is also additional history. Now HIV is in West and Central Africa in the 1960s in high enough prevalence rates. It was probably carried from West to Eastern Africa in the 1970s. It probably took a while to get out of West Africa because of longer distance between cities and difficulty in travel. But by the time it got to East Africa, the spread was rapid. There are countries that are bordering um, uh, Lake Victoria, Tanzania, Tenya, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, where rates were very high by the early 80s. Um, for instance, 85% of the sex workers in Nairobi, Kenya, were infected by 1986 with HIV infection. There was a lot of labor migration at the time, a lot of truck drivers moving between these countries. There was a large and active sex trade. There was a high ratio of men in the urban centers, low status of women, low rates of circumcision, high rates of sexually transmitted infections, and that probably all led to rates of rapid HIV spread in East Africa in the 1980s. Then HIV probably spread from East Africa to South Africa, um, Sub-Saharan Africa by the Tanzan Road between Tanzania and Zambia, and by 1988 and the early 90s, HIV had reached devastating proportions in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as you can see on these a series of epidemiology slides, you can see how rapid the spread was um, from the 1980s onward. This is a slide of the global HIV prevalence rate in adults. In 1985, the darker areas showing higher rates of HIV infection. You can see that here we're starting to see spread to Sub-Saharan Africa. By 1995, HIV in the darker areas had spread all around the African continent and spread into some areas of Southeast Asia over to the US. And by 2005, you can see the very high prevalence rates in all of Africa, higher in Sub-Saharan Africa, and very high rates also spreading to Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc. And now here we are today with the HIV uh, pandemic as of the end of the year 2001. 
As of the latest statistics by UN AIDS, there's a total of 34, point, uh, 34 million people living with HIV infection worldwide. As you can see by the slide in Closer Up, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the rates are the highest. About two-thirds of HIV infections um, reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are increasing and relatively high rates in South and Southeast Asia, in the former Soviet bloc in Eastern Europe, and we're sitting at about 1.4 million in North America, 1.1 million in the United States. The good news and, and what I want to share with you is that certainly I've told you about a lot of depressing things in this lecture to date, but there have been absolutely recent successes in decreasing rates in both HIV incidents and decreasing rates of HIV deaths worldwide with the advent and the spread of antiretroviral therapy, which will be talked about in future lectures in these series. And let me be um, one of the first people in this series to share with you that the World Health Organization has updated its guidelines as of the end of June to recommend treatment worldwide for any HIV-infected patient with a CD4 cell count of less than 500, which should bring rates of antiretroviral treatment exposure up higher uh, worldwide. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you so much for studying with World Med School.